I want to welcome you, those who are here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church. We know we always have some who are watching online, and a special welcome to any of our Granite Bay Hilltop members that are watching from different parts of the world. You know, there's some people scattered around the globe that have no local church they can attend, but through the internet or through satellite, they worship with us every week. And if you would like to know, how do you become uh, one of your online members? We'll talk to you about that. Just email us there at the church. Our message this morning is one that sounds like a, probably a biblical cliche, but it is a biblical phrase about bread from heaven. Bread from heaven. And we're going to be studying the book of, I should say, the um, Gospel of John, chapter 6. Now, we'll be looking at a number of different passages, but that's going to be the core of what we're looking at in the experience there. But um, I kind of always like to start with a little amazing fact. You've probably heard the saying before, an army marches on its stomach. And as near as we can tell, that's been attributed to Napoleon Bonaparte, whose armies were constantly on the move. I think he fought 60 battles in his life, and he only lost seven. He's quite a general. And I'll let history decide, you know, what they thought of him. But uh, he, most agree he was a, a brilliant general. He actually offered an award, knowing how important it was to feed an army, to keep an army moving, and how important the supply line was. He offered 12,000 francs to anybody who could come up with a plan or some formula to store food for longer periods so that an army could take stored food and it would keep better. Well, nobody actually collected the award for uh, 12 years. And then someone by the name of Nicholas Arpat, who was a candy maker, he wanted to claim the award, and he had been doing experimenting, and he developed the first primitive canned food, which was really, you know, the French, they did it in wine bottles. And he started out by putting peas, I think he used a funnel, in wine bottles, and then he'd He'd boil them and seal them, cork them with a uh, cork and then seal them with wax, and, and they kept for a lot longer than anything else had kept. And the formula just kept getting better, and the bottles got more practical, and eventually it went to cans, and then it went to more dried fruit and freeze-dried fruit and MREs and chemicals, and now there's all kinds of ways to preserve food. But the idea was you need to feed an army when they're moving. They eat a lot of food. This principle is in the Bible. For example, take my word for it. Don't lose your place in John. It's in Judges 8, 4, and 5. When Gideon came to the Jordan, after him and his 300 soldiers were chasing the Midianite enemies, and him and his 300 men who were with him, they crossed over exhausted but still in pursuit. And he said to the men of Succoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted. They're finding it hard to fight when they were hungry. Again, 1 Samuel. You maybe remember the story King Saul kind of made a rash statement. He said, A curse be upon anybody who eats any food until I'm avenged of my enemies, the Philistines. And all the soldiers fought the Philistines all day long. Well, Jonathan did not hear the order. Jonathan was his son. So as he went through the wood, being hungry, he stuck the end of his spear in some honey that was dripping on the ground and ate it. And everybody looked at him and said, you didn't hear your father's oath that nobody was to eat all day. Here's how Jonathan responded. My father has troubled the land. Look and see how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely. If the soldiers had been able to eat, there would have been a much bigger victory. An army moves on its stomach. Moses had to deal with that, didn't he? After the children of Israel came out of the wilderness, you had to feed them. Now, you know, God did not feed them with bread from heaven right away. He wanted them to experience hunger first. You know what they say? Hunger is the best sauce. Everything tastes better when you're hungry. I've never been hungry enough to eat canned peas. <laughs> I hope the Lord never tests me on that. But in Deuteronomy 8, and Jesus quotes from this when he's tempted by the devil, Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger. 
And he fed you with manna, but before he fed them, he allowed them a hunger. And he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor your fathers did not know, that he might make you know that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And you know the story. After a few days in the wilderness, they were leaving Egypt, and they had basically put some food in a backpack, and they had enough for, you know, a picnic or two. And their food ran out, and they're heading off into the wilderness towards Mount Sinai, and they got hungry. And pretty soon, they were murmuring and complaining and saying, we're dying of hunger. And it wasn't that bad yet, but they were hungry. And then God said, look, I have a plan. I wouldn't have saved you and not thought about this. We're going to rain bread from heaven. And when that manna came down from heaven, you know what the word manna means? Manna means, what is it? Because when it first appeared, they all looked at it, and it says it was round, it was like a whitish yellow color, like coriander seed, and when they made it into loaves or, or uh, tacos or whatever they made out of it, it, it um, they said it tasted like honey wafers. So here you read that, and Exodus 16 is where the manna appears. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven. There you've got it in the Bible, bread from heaven. And the people will go out and gather a certain quota every day that I might test them whether they will walk in my law or not. You have bread is just core to the experience of Israel. First time you find bread in the Bible, who knows what chapter? Who knows what book? Genesis chapter 3. In the sweat of your face, you will eat your bread. And you find it all the way in Revelation, except it calls it manna there. So you find bread from cover to cover in the Bible. And as you already know, it's an analogy of Jesus. And so that's just something to think about. The average man in North America eats 153, no, sorry, 53 pounds of bread per year. That's a lot of bread. Do you know the bread sales have gone down in the last few years for the first time in many years in North America? But uh, bread is ubiquitous, and it seems like it's part of every meal. You can read here in Nehemiah 9.15, You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger, and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst, and told them to go in and possess the land that you had sworn to, given them, to give them. Psalm 105, verse 40, the people asked and he brought quail and satisfied them with the bread of heaven. Now that was quite a feat because it tells us that when Moses first numbered the people, there were 600,000 men who could fight starting at age 20 and they probably stopped at age 50. And you figure then you add in the women and the children and the older men and the younger boys and conservatively, there are over 2 million. Some estimate there must have been at least 2.4 million. Can you imagine having to feed 2.4 million people every day? That's why Moses nearly pulled his hair out when the people began to complain about the bread. And he said, where am I going to find food for all these people in the wilderness? And God said, Moses, my hand is not, my arm is not shortened that I cannot save. I'm God. And he did it not only with the manna, but later also with the quail. So what we're talking about today is we're talking about the miracle of the manna, the miracle of multiplication, the miracle of migration, and then the meaning of the miracles. Those miracles are mentioned all in John chapter 6. So if you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6, you're probably already there. And I'll start at the first verse. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, also goes by the name Gennesaret, same body of water. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw the signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And you read in the Gospel of Mark, it says he was healing all manner of sickness and disease among the people. Everybody that came to him, he healed them, and he taught them. And then Jesus went up on a mountain where he sat with his disciples. And the time was the time of the Passover fast. It was near. Now, the reason I mentioned the Passover is because there was a lot of pilgrims coming from around the Roman Empire that were going down through the Jordan Valley, and so there was an unusual 
unusually high number of people in the vicinity at this time. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where can we buy bread that these might eat? But this he said to test them, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him and said, 200 denarii worth of bread, that's like three quarters of a year's wages, is not sufficient for them to just have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Now I want to read this to you from some of the other Gospels just to give a little more insight in what's happening here. In Mark chapter 6, verse 35, it says, When the day was far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. They were up in a region known as Bethsaida. It's across from Capernaum on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. It was actually south of what, where the town was because it was in the desert south of Bethsaida. And it says there were some hills there. And if you look at the geography, that was the only place that it could have been. And so originally Jesus said to the disciples, come aside by yourselves into a quiet place so we can rest a while. They were supposed to go there and rest, but everybody found out where they were and the crowds began to follow him. And so he taught them again. And after a long day of teaching, the day is far spent. The disciples said, it's deserted here. There's nowhere to shop. They're going to be hungry. Send them away. By the way, I tell you, I hope I could preach like Jesus. People would listen all day without thinking about food. That was a miracle. That's the, the extra miracle in the story. And they said, send them away that they might go to the surrounding country. Does Jesus want us to send them away? You know what he said? You give them something to eat. God does not want us to send people away hungry, especially spiritually hungry. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii? Of course, we know this was Philip that said that. With their bread and give them something to eat? And what does Jesus say? What do you have? He doesn't say, what don't you have? Jesus always wants to know, well, what do you have? A woman comes to Jesus. She says, my husband is dead. The creditor is going to take everything. He's going to take my sons and to be his slaves. And we don't have the money to pay. And Elisha says, well, what do you have? Well, we've got a little jar of oil. When she brought what she did have to Elisha, it multiplied and took care of all the problems. Now, some of us don't have as many maybe resources or natural gifts as others. But if you consecrate what you do have, a little with Jesus ends up becoming a lot. Everybody has something. And so they said, well, we have a little bit. There's, there's a boy here, and he's got five loaves and two fish. You know, five little pita breads and two sardines. Didn't matter. It's not much. And they say, what's that? And Jesus says, oh, got something. I can work with that. If you consecrate the little you have to the Lord, there's no limit to what he can do. And then he tells them, you don't read this in John, but in the other Gospels it says, he said, sit the people down in companies of fifties and a hundreds. Or was it fifties and tens? And so the people are all divided up in groups, and they're sitting down in smaller groups. And he said, make the people sit down. I'm in verse 10. About 5,000 men, they're including women and children, there are many more. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks. Now, one reason he has the people sit down is because they can see what's going to happen. Another reason he has them sit down in small groups is when the miracle does happen, they can talk to each other about it. It's a lot nicer to eat together, right? To meet and eat together. By the way, you know what the word companion means? Companion? Companion comes from a composite of two Latin words, com, with, pana, bread. And it means someone you eat bread with is your companion. And so they made some new companions that day by sitting down with this group and eating with them. We try to make companions virtually every week. We have a visitor's dinner. This is probably a good place for me to just mention that 
Some of us count on a miracle every week that God will multiply the bread for our visitors' lunch. If you're a regular member, we hope you're bringing something to contribute to the miracle every week. Can I get an amen? amen? Thank you very much. All right. I believe in miracles, but I also don't think we should tempt the Lord every week, right? Sometimes I go to potluck, and when I get to the end of the line, there's no luck left in the pot. So <laughs> let's be realistic here. <laughs> so he says, have them sit down. He takes the loaves, and he gave thanks. And the Bible tells us, not in John, but in Mark and Matthew, he broke it. And somehow it multiplies. Now, have you wished you could see a video of how that exactly played out? It says he breaks the bread and he gives it to not the apostles. How many apostles? He uses the word disciples. How many disciples? Many. Because you've got 5,000 people. 12 guys it's take a long time. So he's not just using the apostles. He's using disciples. And Jesus is breaking it. And as near as I can imagine in my mind, as he breaks it, the bread's just swelling in his hands. Like he breaks it and this one turns into two again. And he breaks it and it just keeps, and exponentially it keeps coming out of the basket. And with the fish, they just kept growing new heads every time he broke them. And he's <laughs> passing it out. And I, I want to see the replay of this when I get to heaven. I don't know exactly how it happened, but it's multiplying. And everyone's watching this happen, and they're going, what in the world is going on? It's a miracle. The last time somebody performed a miracle like that was who? Elisha. You read the story of Elisha. It says some prophets came to him. They didn't have enough food. And with just uh, a few loaves of bread, they fed 100 men. And so he multiplied bread. By the way, Elisha's name is very much like the name Jesus. Jesus' name is God is Savior. Elisha's name is Elohim, God is Savior. Just uses a different word for God. But Moses. Now, Moses had prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 18, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet unto you like me. Doesn't say what his name was. It wasn't saying it's a resurrection of Elijah. It just says, the Lord is going to send a prophet like me. And so whenever the Jews referred to this enigmatic prophet, they called him that prophet. When they came to John the Baptist, they said, are you Elijah or Jeremiah or that prophet? You'll find that phrase, that prophet. They're talking about the prophet who would come like Moses. Don't forget that because it comes into the story here. He blesses it. He took the loaves and distributed to his disciples and the disciples of those sitting down and likewise the fish as much as they wanted and when they were filled does the Lord fill us does the Lord satisfy you know I, I love that promise that uh, God makes our cup run over he blessed it he gave thanks he broke it you know God uses broken things it takes broken soil to produce a crop, broken clouds to give rain and grain, broken bread to give strength. It's a broken alabaster box that gives perfume. It's Peter brokenhearted that goes weeping and comes forth with greater power. And it says they were all filled. Mark 6.42, they all ate and were filled. Psalm 145, you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Psalm 23, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Psalm 78, 24, he rained down manna on them to eat, and he gave them bread from heaven. Men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. I don't know. Now, who does this bread represent? Jesus. I haven't done it in a long time, but there used to be a song a few years ago. Heritage singers used to sing it. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Jesus satisfies. You ever go away from a meal and you didn't get, get quite enough? <laughs> and you think that was good, but it wasn't near enough. How nice it is to be satisfied, to be satiated. And then the Lord tells them, make sure you don't waste anything. He says in verse 12, so when they were filled, he said to them, gather up the fragments that remain so nothing is lost. You know, I hope it doesn't escape you that if Jesus 
cares about not losing breadcrumbs and fish does he care about not losing people? He didn't want the bread to be lost. What about you? He doesn't want you to be lost. I also think that the Lord is, he's economical. So why did he tell him to gather up the fragments? Couldn't he say, ah, oh, look, there's more where that came from. I can make more tomorrow. Why did he do that? Well, he wasn't going to keep making manna all the time. By the way, when the children of Israel finally entered the promised land and it was harvest time, the manna ceased. God said, now you're going to eat the way other people. You're going to have to go grow and gather your food. It didn't happen all the time. It was a miracle for extreme circumstances. But uh, God performs these miracles to show us that he can supply our needs. And he didn't want to waste it for one reason. As they gathered up those 12 baskets... And they carried them home. People thought, did we just imagine that or did it really happen? They had evidence. The other thing is there were pilgrims still going to the feast. They didn't have enough food. And as they went back to their families and their friends carrying these baskets of miraculous leftovers, the miracle continues to be told and retold. They said, here's some right here. We saw it started with five loaves, two fish, 5,000 men plus women and children ate, and we have leftovers. You know, God often reinforces his miracle by residual effect. Not only were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saved from the furnace, but for those who didn't think it was hot, it killed the soldiers that threw them in. There was evidence. Not only did God part the sea that the Israelites could cross over, some people, well, the water wasn't very deep. It wasn't a miracle. Well, it drowned the Egyptians. God, the lions weren't really hungry. That's why they didn't eat Daniel. Well, they ate the men who conspired against Daniel right after. See, God always gives some residual evidence of his miracles. Not only does he raise Lazarus up, but then Lazarus walks around town. People see him. So he says, gather up the fragments so nothing is lost. So they gathered them up. And there were five, and they gathered 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves that those who had eaten. From five loaves, 12 baskets of food. And when those who had seen the sign that Jesus did, they said, truly, this is the prophet who is to come into the world. He is the one that Moses spoke about. Why did they think about that? Could Moses multiply bread? And now he fed them miraculously. You can understand their logic. Okay, so this is the miracle of the multiplication for the multitude. Now we're going to talk about the miracle of the migration in this chapter. And then Jesus ties it all together for us in the end. Therefore, when Jesus perceived they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, why are they going to make him king? What did Napoleon say? An army marches on its stomach, they wanted to fight the Romans. They said, we, we got the food problem taken care of. If we make, he's the Messiah. Who else would have this power? We're going to make him king right now. We'll go to war. We don't have to worry about the supply train. He'll feed us. All we need is five loaves and two fish, and he can just keep feeding everybody. So he, Jesus hears the murmurings and the rabble-rousers saying, let's take him. He doesn't, he's too modest. We're going to take him by force and make him king. And he sees it's getting out of hand, and people are developing posters to campaign for him. And Jesus tells the apostles, get in the boat, go across the sea, back to Capernaum, I'll catch up with you. And they can see he's being very stern. He, just, he doesn't say this is open for discussion. He says, get in the boat, go now. So they go, then he dismisses the crowd. By the way, some of this is in John, some you have to read in Mark and Matthew. He tells the crowd, go. They're in the wilderness. He says, you're on your way to the feast. Nothing happening here. Go. And he sends them away. And then he heads up into the mountain to pray. And he's praying that night for the disciples. When Jesus perceived they were going to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got in the boat. And they went uh, over the sea towards Capernaum. And it was already dark. And Jesus had not come to them. 
Then the sea arose because of a great wind. They thought maybe Jesus would come in a follow-up boat or something. Then the sea arose because of a great wind that was blowing. This powerful north wind was blowing down and stopping their progress. And they rowed hard three or four miles. They weren't getting anywhere. By the way, I got a map I'm putting up on the screen. Let me see. Put that up there for the, those in the church. Yeah. Just so you get uh, an idea of what's happening topographically. By the way, this is a modern map. I got this off Google Earth. This is a modern map of Galilee, what it looks like today. The Bethesda Desert you see on the right, Capernaum you see on the left. The town of Bethesda was actually further north, but he was actually in the Bethesda Desert. You see mountain range comes there. Back in the time of Jesus, the Sea of Galilee was deeper. Uh, because of not only massive pumping in the last 70 years and irrigation, drought, seismic changes, the water level is lower today than it used to be. Much lower in the Dead Sea, but lower here. And so the water level almost came up to the mountains back then. And so Jesus goes up to the mountain. He's praying. He sent them across the sea. They, based on the distance here, they are out in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the night. They're rowing and Jesus sees their dilemma. He finishes his praying. He walks down into the water, and he just begins to walk out across the water towards them. So this is the miracle of the migration. And it says, So when they rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. It's dark. I don't know if there lightning flashed or there was a moon out. They saw Jesus walking on the sea, drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. The other Gospels tell us he, they cried out in terror. They see this phantom on the waters coming towards them. That would be pretty spooky. And you'll notice something else is um, who were witnessing partners? You've got uh, Andrew and James were witnessing partners. Who was Peter's witnessing partner when Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit? He sent them out two by two. It was Peter and John. Who's writing the gospel we're reading? John. Do you notice that there's a story that's left out here? It's a story about Peter walking on the water. This is when it happens. He doesn't mention that. I don't know if he didn't want to embarrass Peter because Peter loses faith and he sinks. He get, gets all wet, you know, at the end of the story. But John leaves that out. He certainly knew about it. So they saw Jesus, and he said, It's I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. You know, technology is amazing, how voice can travel through the air, and television images can travel through the air, and so many things we used to watch on Star Trek are happening today. They've actually got flying cars. It's like the Jetsons. And Dick Tracy watches where I can see video on my watch. Any of you remember that? I thought, oh, that's science fiction. You wonder, will they be able to beam people from place to place? This is a story where Jesus beams the boat and everybody in it to the shore. By the way, can you get the church to heaven? Amen. You know, another time in the Bible says, Philip baptized the Ethiopian treasurer and they came up out of the water and the Spirit of the Lord took Philip and he found himself suddenly walking down the road miles away. There may be one other example in the Bible. I'll let you find it. But here, the boat, boom, it's there. By the way, when does Jesus come to them? He tells them to cross the sea. He doesn't tell them it is going to be easy. When he comes to them and does a miracle, they are doing their human best to do his will. This is the way it comes with temptation. God tells you his will. He doesn't say it's going to be easy to fight temptation. He can perform a miracle of victory for you, but he doesn't perform the miracle if you don't row. You catch that? When he came to them, they were rowing. They received him, and they got the victory. They were at their destination. So God supplies supernatural power with human effort. He multiplied the bread, but first he said, bring me five loaves and two fish. He wants us to do humanly what we can do. Then God works miracles. Amen? So suddenly they're at the destination where they were going. 
Now we hear about the miracles of explaining the miracles. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boats there except the one that the, his disciples had entered, when the people had come around from Bethsaida and from Tiberias, they, they came in and said, wait, Jesus was still on the mountain. His disciples crossed the sea. But then they hear there's a big crowd around the synagogue. You might be wondering how I know that. That's the, the last part I'm going to read here. In verse 59, it says, he said this in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So he's already, it's morning, he's teaching already back at the synagogue. And they said, how did he get here? It says in verse 23, Howbeit other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and they came to Capernaum seeing, seeking Jesus. And they found him on the other side of the sea. They said to him, Rabbi, how did you get here? What, did you walk on water? Yeah, that's how he got there. <laughs> and Jesus answered and he said to them, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to everlasting life. Now Jesus is stating a very powerful truth here. Most of us, as we go to work from week to week, we labor for the food that perishes. Jesus is saying our principal labor should be for the food that endures to everlasting life. They're coming to him and they're saying, you know, Moses fed the people from heaven every day except Sabbath. We got food yesterday. What about today? There, you ever heard the expression rice Christians? As long as you were giving away free rice, they had an audience when they were doing a mission work in China. So they're called rice Christians. And... Uh, I know a pastor, I don't approve of his methods, but he would tell the people that if they would come to his meetings, he'd give all the ladies a free sari. Well, they would come. And once they got their free sari, they wouldn't come. Is that why we should come to Jesus? Because of the, the, um, the coupon, the free things that we get? It's got to be because we love the Lord. Amen. He says, labor for that food that endures to everlasting life that the Son of Man is going to give you because God has set his seal upon him, meaning the, the seal of approval that this is the Messiah, the evidence that he is the Messiah. The Spirit of God without measure was given to Jesus. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit, right? Christ at his baptism was sealed by the Holy Spirit. And then they, they said to him, what shall we do? that we may do the works of God. All right, those of you who are interested in works, here's your work. The Bible says there is a work to do. Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. Do you know that there is a work for us to do? Will there be something that separates the saved from the lost? Yeah. One word. Faith. Belief. He said, here is the work. Believe. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes. Without faith, it's impossible to, believe, uh, to be saved. The Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. Saved by faith through grace. It actually works both ways. It's through faith. Jesus would heal someone. Your faith has made you whole. Faith is the key. Believe on the one whom God has sent. Then they said, what sign? He says faith. And they say, what sign will you perform that we may see it and believe? What work will you do? Now, he had been healing people and cleansing lepers and performing miracles. He had just fed them miraculously. And what do they say? We want a sign. You know, I, I had um, a nice visit with a pastor from India last week. And he said one of the big problems with the church in India he says the pastors keep teaching and preaching signs and wonders and they manufacture these signs and wonders and they have healing crusades and the people, some might have some, you know, placebo effect healing and it's all a lot of sensation and stuff. And he, he said they got to just crank it up every week. More signs and wonders, more signs and wonders, more signs and wonders. And he said, and the people don't stay. 
He's got the fastest growing church in India. He says, we don't do signs and wonders. He says, we preach the Bible. Amen. By the way, you'll see an interview I did with him on AFTV not too long from now. But um, the signs and wonders doesn't last. Jesus said, if you don't believe Moses and the prophets, you won't be persuaded that one should rise from the dead. Amen? It's got to be the Moses, the word of God is what we believe. They said, do a sign and wonder. Then they go on and they say, verse 31, our fathers ate manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're hinting, do it again. At least six days a week, you know. One of the ways God reinforced the miracle of the, um, the Sabbath is they would get manna five days a week. If they tried to save it, it would stink and breed worms. But when they gathered twice as much on Friday, it would keep overnight for Sabbath, and it was still fresh. And the manna, that they took some of the manna, they put it in a pot, and it was put in the ark of the Lord. You can read in Hebrews, it says, in the ark, Aaron's rod that budded, Ten Commandments, and a little pot, golden pot of manna to remember the miracle how God miraculously supplied bread from heaven, angels' food for them. So you not only had the bread on the 12 loaves in the sanctuary that was put out fresh every Sabbath, but you had the manna right there before the ark. Who does that bread represent? Jesus. Where was Jesus born? What town? Bethlehem means house of bread. And where did they put Jesus after he was born as a baby? In a manger. A manger is a, a stone or wooden box for putting grain in. That's bread. Here the bread of life was born in the house of bread and put in a bread box. Jesus is trying to tell us something. He is the bread of life. Now, bread is everywhere in our culture. It, it's part of almost, how many of you would say the bread is part of almost every meal? If you eat cereal in the morning, that's grain, that's bread. If I eat Mexican food with beans, rice is a kind of bread, and certainly tortilla chips. If you go to Olive Garden or Spaghetti Factory, you're always saying, could you please bring me some more bread? Bread is it's just in every culture. There's all these different kinds of bread. I had a list somewhere. I don't know if I brought it out here with me. All the different kinds of bread that they've got. Oh, I'm not going to waste your time. Oh, yeah, here it is. Baguette. Brioche. Hala. Ciabatta. Cornbread. Focata. Multigrain. Pita. Potato bread. Pumpernickel. Rye bread. Soda bread. Sourdough. Tortilla. Whole wheat. If you're on the Navajo Reservation, fry bread. There are actually 6,000 different kinds of bread. Because it's just such a staple in our lives. It used to be years ago when mom sent someone to the store and said, get a loaf of bread. You go to the store, there was a bakery, there were the loaves, you grab a loaf, you go home. Now, if Karen says, Doug, can you pick up a loaf of bread? I have a meltdown. Because I go to the bakery and there's just all this different kinds of bread. And I'm going, you know, there's, I know not to eat the wonder bread. <laughs> it's a wonder that's still around. <laughs> Do you know you can use Wonder Bread, you ball it up, and you can plug holes before you, if you have nail holes and you want to paint, you plug it in, if, as long as the rats don't find it and eat your wall away, but it, it, it'll, you can plug the holes. Do you know that bread used to be used for erasers, for graphite, before they invented rubber erasers? They'd use a ball of a piece of bread and erase it. So I go to the store and there's all this different bread. I've got the multigrain and they got the, the sourdough and all these different things, different levels, and you get angry Dave's bread or whatever it is, and all the, the different <laughs> different kinds of bread. And I'll actually call Karen and I'll say, What kind of bread am I supposed to get? <laughs> and she said, We'll get what you like. I said, I don't know what I like. <laughs> There's so much. But I heard about a pastor. This is true almost all around the world. There's some kind of bread, right? It's part of every meal. I heard about a pastor that was working with the Inuit up in Greenland, and he was translating the Bible. And when he got to the part where Jesus said, I am the bread of life, he said, there's no bread up here. They don't grow anything that resembles any kind of bread up here. And he labored and labeled, finally, I'm not condoning what he did, but the only thing he could come up with is, he said, I am the seal meat that came down from heaven. 
because that was something that was part of every meal. <laughs> That's about the only thing that they could think of. But everywhere else in the world, bread is, it's the staple of life. And so they're saying, give us bread. But he said, you don't want the right kind of bread. You need to labor for that bread that does not perish. And then Jesus answered them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me will never hunger. This is the first of several I am statements that Jesus makes. Now, he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. I am the door. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the bread. I am the living water. I am. And he's using the same phrase in all these I am statements that Jehovah uses there at the burning bush when Moses takes the shoes off, saying, I am the self-existent one. Jesus is clearly putting himself on the level of God, the Father Almighty, when he says this, I am. Amen? Amen? And he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he that believes in me will never thirst. Now, are you clear that this is an analogy? He's talking about spiritual hunger, spiritual thirst. That's why in the Beatitudes, he that hungers and thirsts for righteousness will be filled. He's talking about the satisfaction for righteousness. You'll never thirst. You'll never hunger. But, you, but I said to you that you've seen me and yet you do not believe. He's saying believe is the important thing. All the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. That's a wonderful promise. The Holy Spirit works in everyone's heart. Some respond to the leading of the Spirit. Come to Jesus he embraces all that come. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. When we're born again, we live for his will. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all that he gives me, I will lose nothing, but I'll raise it up the last day. Great theology here. When is the resurrection? As soon as a person dies or the last day? And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up the last day. I've underlined all the times he talks about everlasting life, bread, and the resurrection. The Jews complained about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? That's the same thing they said in the synagogue there in Nazareth that got them in trouble. He said, how could he be the one whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said, do not murmur among yourselves. He always knew their hearts. He can read your heart even right now. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. It's through the Spirit of God that we're drawn. And I'll raise him up at the last day. Again, when is the resurrection? It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught of God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except him who is from God. He's seen the Father. Jesus has seen God the Father in his glory. All the other people that said they saw God have seen God the Son. When uh, Jacob said, I've seen God and I'm going to die. Or when it says Abraham saw God, it was usually a Christophany of Jesus before his incarnation. No man has seen the Father Will we in heaven see the Father? Now we look through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Can you imagine that? I am the living bread. I'm in verse 51. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 50. No, no, no. Verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they're dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat it and not die. Notice, life saying, not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh that I give for the world, for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? I mean, clearly he's speaking in symbols. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Of course, during the Last Supper, he emphasizes what that is all about. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up in the last day. 
Again, he says it. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father. Now here's the summary of everything he's saying. I know there's just so much deep stuff here. Theologians will spend years studying these passages. But everything he's saying about bread, he summarizes here. Verse 57 as the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. As Jesus came into the world and he was empowered by the Father to do the work that he did, so when we come to Christ, we are crucified to self, we're born again, we live a new life, we are empowered by Christ the way Christ was empowered by the Father. Jesus lived the life he lived through the power of the Spirit through connection with the Father, we live different lives through the power of Christ, through connection with Him. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they're dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Have you noticed how often he's emphasizing not die forever, live life, no life without me, eternal life, raise him up, he who feeds on me will live. He will live forever. What do you think Jesus is trying to, and I didn't quote them all. Verse 35, life. Everlasting life, verse 40. What is Jesus telling us with this big emphasis on life, 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 life? We're dying. You don't need to spend all your time talking to people about life if they're already, if they have it. But without Christ, he that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son has not life. Unless you believe in him and you come to him, you're terminal. I read um, a story this last week. Uh, a lady that got a misdiagnosis from the doctor, the lab report. She had pancreatic cancer. Five-year survival rate, only 7%. It's pretty tough. Now, when you get a diagnosis like that, it can be rather shocking. And um, you realize you got a terminal disease and, and uh, get your house in order. You go through a time of grieving and, and your family gets together and you all cry. And it, it's, it's pretty shocking when you realize, I'm going to die. Then the doctor called back and said, we are so sorry. It was a misdiagnosis. It turns out it's a tumor attached to your pancreas that is entirely benign and operable. You're going to live. Now how do you feel? Feel pretty good. But you're still terminal. Right? It just means you're going to live a little longer. We've all got an expiration date. When Jesus talks about life here, he's not talking about the health message. I believe in the health message. He's not trying to eke out a little more life here. He's talking about everlasting life. How do you get it? Through eating the bread that comes down from, by making the bread from heaven, which is Jesus. He said, I am the bread that came. Everything that happened in the wilderness, that was an analogy of me. That this miracle bread would come from heaven to feed and satisfy spiritually. But he said, don't labor for the bread that perishes. The people that ate Moses' bread, they're all dead. So I'm offering you bread where you won't die. And again, he's clearly not talking about physical death because they would all get old and die. But he was offering them a bread where you didn't have to be afraid of dying because you've got eternal life. That's something to be excited about. I saw there was this fable. It's illustrated. This, this man is caught in a communist country. He had crossed over and they caught, they put him in jail. He's in a primitive jail where some old guard is guarding him. And uh, the guard is eating this sandwich. The man hasn't been fed in days and he's starving. And um, the guard is called out. And the old guard leaves the room. And there he leaves his cane up by the bars where this man is in prison. And on one table there's the sandwich that the guard started eating. And on another table there's some keys. So the man realizes, I can use the cane and pull the table over and eat the sandwich. 
or I can use the cane and pull the table over and grab the keys and get out across the river and be free. Which would you do? Get the keys. But no, most people go for the cupcake. They think of an immediate gratification. We labor for the bread that is not going to satisfy. Isn't that right? We become preoccupied with making ourselves comfortable in our terminal condition. Jesus said, labor, priority, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness for that bread that does not perish. This is the bread, verse 58, that came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Telling us about living forever, that he is the bread of life. I was uh, reading an amazing fact and um, one of the greatest discoveries of the last century was penicillin. You know how many people have been saved by antibiotics? They had nothing before penicillin. Do you know how penicillin was discovered? Fleming, the biologist, was um, doing his, studying all these bacteria in petri dishes and he was a, a brilliant scientist but he wasn't the neatest lab technician and he had left all these different bacteria in the petri dishes and, and left some lunch out and he went on vacation. And he came back after his vacation and he went to clean up his petri dishes and he said, oh, look at that, this mold is growing on the, oh, look at that, the bacteria seems to be dead next to the mold. Seems like this mold is killing the bacteria. And he discovered the greatest thing quite by accident. And what he had was a piece of bread that was dying. Moldy piece of bread. Now, don't eat moldy bread thinking it's going to make you feel better because most of the mold is not penicillin. There's like four or five different molds that grow on bread. But one of four is penicillin. It's called penicillium, and that's where we get the name. Dying bread. That's what happens when bread gets moldy. Gave life to the world. Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. He says, I, I'm broken for you. I'm dying for you. But you need to take it in. It doesn't do, do you any good unless it's on the inside. Like the illustration for the children's story, appreciated. You've got to have the person's foot in the shoe. The hand must be in the glove. Christ must be in us in order for the miracle to take place. How many of you would like to say, Lord, give me this bread that I might never hunger again. We're going to sing about it. I'd like to invite our singers to come out. And let's stand together as we sing this great anthem of the church. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. I want to hear you sing, especially the part about bread from heaven. This is our prayer. Feed us till we want no more. Satisfy us with that bread of life that Jesus has provided to save the world. Lord, and I pray that we'll make this practical every day. We know that an army moves on its stomach. We, the church, need to be feeding and feasting on your word every day that we might be saturated in every fiber with the truth that sets us free. I pray that you'll bless us to make it a priority in our life, not to become distracted by seeking the bread that perishes, but that bread that satisfies for everlasting life. Bless with the many needs represented among your people, Lord. Give us your spirit and your power. Help us be your witnesses as we go from this place. We thank you and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.